Okay, we're going to start a new series uh, in the letter to the Galatians today. And we're going to go through this letter verse by verse for the next several weeks. Um, so turn with me to Galatians. And we're going to look at the first five verses of this letter. Just the introductory part. not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So pretty short. Um, this is the, uh, just the introductory part. That's a good place to begin. It's the beginning. Um, like I said, we're going to be going to the, uh, the, the epistle to the Galatians for the next several weeks. Uh, I'm going to intersperse um, this series with, a, with different passages from uh, different parts of the Bible. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Um, now, the first thing to note is that this is uh, a letter to the churches of Galatia. Uh, these are churches that Paul had established during one of his missionary journeys uh, and had left behind in order to plant churches in other locations because Paul was ambitious. He wanted to spread the gospel to every corner of the, of the Roman Empire. And um, he kept in touch with the Galatians through, through letters. Now, you have to understand the letters written back then uh, followed a certain convention. They had a certain form. There, there was a certain, certain accepted practices when it came to letter writing, certain conventions that you had to follow. Usually letters began with salutations, the writer's name, the recipient's name, and greetings. And um, this was uh, the, the form that this letter particular letter follows. That, that's how this letter begins. But what's unusual about this particular letter is that Paul's salutation is longer than what was customary. And if you compare it to uh, what he wrote in uh, his other epistles, it's longer than what he wrote in, you know, in his other letters. You know why? It's because after he left the churches of Galatia, the churches began to be troubled by uh, false teachers. These teachers uh, mounted an attack on Paul, uh, an attack on his authority as an apostle, and on his uh, message of the gospel. They insisted that uh, you need more than faith in Jesus. You also need um, to be circumcised. You also need to follow the laws of Moses. So they contradicted Paul's gospel of justification through faith alone, by grace alone. And this bothered Paul. Uh, so bothered was Paul, so eager was he to defend his authority as an apostle, to defend his um, gospel of grace, that he doesn't wait till he gets to the body of the letter to, uh, to make his point. He, he jumps into his point right at the beginning of the letter, right in his salutations. Now, if you're trying to defend the gospel, uh, where do you start? Well, you start with the gospel. You start by explaining what the gospel is. And that's what he does. That's what he does in verses 3 and 4. So in verses 3 and 4, we get a synopsis of the gospel, a summary of the gospel. Uh, the gospel in its uh, abbreviated form, the gospel in a nutshell. Now, what is the gospel? That's really what I want to explain today. The gospel has to do with three words or phrases that you see in this letter. Uh, it has to do with the word sin. It has to do with the phrase, uh, Jesus Christ um, gave himself for our sins. And it has to do with the word deliver. Now, th that's the outline of the message that I'm going to follow today. Um, so, 
what is sin, first of all? Now, the common uh, way of understanding sin is that sin is a transgression of a divine law. It's, it's lying, it's cheating, it's adultery, it's, it's stealing, you know, those kinds of things. But I think that's an inadequate definition. I, I find that definition inadequate. Basically, do you know what sin is? Sin is alienation from God. It's separation from God. I think that's how the Bible defines sin. Um, it's separation from God, which leads to alienation and separation from one another. And this leads to uh, our attempts to base our happiness, our joy in life, on something that we try to achieve independent of God. It leads to the exchanging of a higher satisfaction in God for a lesser one in other things. St. Augustine, uh, Blaise Pascal, Jonathan Edwards, C.S. Lewis, all knew what sin was. They all knew that sin was um, the way that we try to orient our lives towards the things that we try to achieve rather than towards God. That's what sin is. It's a turning away from the good that we find in God and the turning towards a lesser good in other things. It's the removal of God from the place of highest joy and highest value and the highest authority in our lives. And it's our attempts to, to fill the hole left by the vacancy of God with other things. So sin is alienation that we feel, um, um, the alienation and separation that we have from God. And even if you're a Christian, I mean, if you're a Christian, theoretically, you're no longer separated from God, right? But even if you're a Christian, you know that sometimes you feel this way. So you might have felt this way this week, um, far away from God, separated from God. And that's because we're still in the grips and throes of sin. And we'll be that way for the rest of our lives. This, this is our natural state. We all have a tendency to say no to God's joy and yes to taking pleasure in ourselves. No to God's joy and, and taking pleasure in accumulating material things. No to God's joy and taking pleasure in something that we try to accomplish apart from God. And just to point, uh, push the point a little longer, and I'm not, I'm not denying that there is pleasure in les lesser things. Uh, I'm not denying that. But the problem is that sooner or later, the, the pleasure that we gain from these lesser things, uh, they fade. They, they're lost. And the worst thing can happen. The things that once gave us pleasure, we can become enslaved to. And you know how that might work. For example, if you gain pleasure from your appearance, you, you might gain pleasure from it for a little while, but sooner or later, you start to need it. You start to need to look as beautiful as you can all the time. You must have it. Right? Uh, you, you don't even go outside without putting on makeup. because You have to look beautiful. Or uh, you might take pleasure in work, in doing a good job at work. But pretty soon work dominates your life. Uh, you, you can't find meaning in life apart from your work. Uh, you derive all, all your satisfaction in life from your work. And you become a workaholic, you become addicted to work. Now those are just two examples. You know the attitude of the Christian with regard to the things of this world uh, which we have a tendency to get addicted to. Our attitude should be, whether I am blessed or afflicted, whether I'm living uh, well or living poorly, I will remember that this world is passing away. I will re remember that another kingdom is coming, and I will praise God. If God sends me peace and prosperity, I, I will give him praise. If he sends me the good things of this life, uh, I will recognize that it is God who bestowed these favors upon me. But if God changes my circumstances and, and takes the good things away and brings me afflictions instead, that won't stop me from praising him either. I'll still praise him. Because it's not enough for me to know that I am his child, that 
and I'm loved by him. That he is mine and I'm his. That's what the Christian attitude should be. Instead of becoming addicted to these things. The problem is that we don't know how to say no to our passions. And we keep exchanging higher satisfactions for lesser ones. And in this way we become slaves. And the only way that we can enjoy the, the secondary things properly in the way that God intends without becoming a slave to those things is putting first things first. Saying yes to the first things, the primary things, the joy that we find in Christ. And, and if we do that, then we can enjoy the secondary things properly. Now the next question. How did Jesus deal with our sins? If sin is alienation from God, separation from God, what was God's remedy for our sin? And the answer that this text provides is that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. And what that means is that he surrendered himself to be done to him what deserved to be done to us. So that God could forgive us, so that God could be the, the joy of our lives, so that we can know him so that we can get in touch with the, the sacred. Now, I often quote this because I think this is a, a very um, good and concise way to get this point across. Jesus Christ lived the life that we couldn't live and died the death that we deserve to die. The death that we deserve to die. Uh, what he went through, he didn't have to go through. Remember when uh, Peter tried to defend him with a sword? And Jesus told him, put away your sword. Don't you know that I can call upon my father? And my father will send me 12 regions of angels, 6,000 angels. So he didn't have to go to the cross. And we mustn't forget the fact that he didn't have to come down to earth at all. And, you know, he was perfectly, good, perfectly content up in heaven. But he came down, and he came down with a mission to go to the cross for our sake for our sins, on our behalf. Now just to rehash something that I said last week for the sake of illustration, I said when we see somebody that we love suffering or in pain, we don't know what to say sometimes, right? So we say something stupid like, um, if only I could bear what you're going through instead of you. Now somebody might hear that and and um, they don't know how to take that, or to take that seriously or not, because we know that's impossible. It doesn't cost us anything to say that. It's easy to say that. We dare say that, because we know that's not going to happen. But Jesus Christ not only said, if I could only bear it instead of you, he, uh, he did bear it. He did bear it for us on the cross for our sake for our sins. Now hearing that, how does that make you feel? Do you know how it should make you feel? It should make you feel, ah, oh, he, he loves us. He loves us more than we have the power to imagine. And we know that he loves us because look at what he's willing to go through for us. Look at what he's willing to, to put up for us. Look at what he's willing to do for us. So the first thing, he loves us. Now the second thing this should make us feel is, wow, you know, sin is much more serious than I thought. It's much more serious than I thought. And it is serious. God thought it was serious. God didn't think that it could simply be, be moved by um, you doing some extra good deeds or by your moral effort. God didn't think that it could be simply overlooked. God didn't think that it could simply be forgotten. His remedy for sin was a cross. So for us to be forgot, uh, forgiven, for us to know him, for us to be reconciled to him, it took that. It, it took Jesus' broken body. What this means is that we can't have a cavalier attitude towards our sin. We simply can't. I mean, that would be defeating the very purpose for which Jesus Christ died. He 
died to set us free from both the power and the consequence of sin, the power of hell and the bondage to sin. And that means that we need to take a, a serious attitude when it comes to sin. We need to have a moral seriousness when it comes to sin because it took nothing less than Jesus having to go to the cross to deal with our sin. So we can't have a cavalier attitude. We can't take sin lightly. That would be tantamount to treating Jesus' sacrifice with disdain. Hebrews 10.29 says that it would be like trampling on the blood of Jesus. Now let's look at uh, one more thing that this passage reveals to us about what the gospel is. And it's insinuated in the word deliver. Other translations prefer to use the word rescue. In verse 4, it says, Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. And what is suggested in the word deliver is that what we get from God is not instruction or advice. It's not instruction or advice about how to get to heaven or about how to get to God or how to achieve salvation. That's not what we get from God, oh no. You know what we get from God? We get deliverance, we get rescue. You know, when we were drowning, he didn't throw at us a, a manual uh, on how to swim. He didn't shout advice at us from, from the seashore. He threw himself into the sea, the sea of death, in order to rescue us, in order to bring us safely to shore. The gospel is not about what we have to do for God. That's the point. The gospel is not what we have to do for God, what we have to give to God. It's about what God has already done for us, what God has given to us. It's good news. The gospel is good news. It's not instruction. It's not instruction. It's not advice. It's not teaching. It's news. It's good news about what Jesus Christ has done. See, that's the fundamental difference between Christianity and other religions. Other religions say, do this and you will live. But Christianity says, God has done this for you and so that you can live. You know, this week I was reading an account from Charles Wesley's life. Charles Wesley is one of the founders of Methodist Church. And Charles Wesley, at a certain point in his life, was very sick. Um, probably close to death. It sounds like he was close to death. And a Moravian um, missionary that he had met during his missionary trip to America, came to visit him and asked him, do you hope to be saved? Do you hope to go to heaven? And uh, Charles said, of course, you know. I mean, what are you gonna say? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course you're gonna say yes. And he said, okay, yes. And the friend asked him, well, on what basis? basis what, for what reason do you have this hope? And Charles said, well, I've always used my best endeavor to serve God. In other words, I've, I've always done my best to serve God. I've always tried my best to please God. And the friend um, just shook his head. And Charles was offended. Charles didn't understand the gospel. He didn't get it. He wasn't saved. He was a missionary he wasn't saved. He had religious activity. He had religious zeal. He wanted other people to hear about Christianity. He went to foreign lands to preach the gospel, but he himself didn't understand the gospel. He wasn't saved. He didn't have the reality of the love of God in his heart. And later, by the way, he did become saved, incidentally, through um, reading Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians, this very book that we're looking at today. This is a very powerful book, you know. It saved Charles Wesley's life. It saved John Wesley's life. It, it led to a revival movement, led to this Methodist church, not this, this Methodist church and Methodist churches throughout the world. The gospel is not 
beautiful gift that you carefully package and present to God. Here it is. It's not. It's not um, self-giving generosity. It's not radical hospitality. It's not loving your neighbor as yourself. It is not, um, it's not any of those things. It's not trying to evangelize as many people as you can. That's not the gospel. Now, a Christian may very well practice all of those things. Those things may very well characterize a Christian's life, but it's not because the gospel requires them. It's not because the gospel requires them. Do you know why Christians do those things? They do those things because they simply think out the implications of the gospel in their lives. They're thinking. They're using their head. They're, they're contemplating all of the ways that the gospel should, uh, should change their lives, should affect their, how they live. But it's not because the gospel is requiring them to do, to do those things. They've been touched by the grace of God. That's why they do those things. They understand the love of God in Christ. They sense the love of God in their hearts. They, they're moved by the love of God. They're amazed by the love of God. They're thrilled by the love of God. They're thrilled by the gospel, and that's why they do those things. If you're touched by the grace of God, of course you're going to be gracious to others. If you're, if you're amazed by the generosity, of course you're going to be generous to others. So the change is organic. The change is natural. It's not dictated. It's not enforced. It's not a forced thing. It's not an, a thing that is imposed upon. The gospel itself does not preach what we are to avoid or what we are to do. In fact, it preaches the very opposite thing. It says, this is what God has done for you. Receive it. Be amazed by it. Be thrilled by it. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's free. So therefore... Therefore, the central concept surrounding the gospel is not obligation, duty, responsibility, work, effort. Those are not the central things. The central thing surrounding the gospel is the grace of God. It's grace. It's grace. It's grace. It's not about you meeting a certain set of requirements. It's about grace. Any, anything that we do for God is not necessary. It's not necessary, but it's a response. The only appropriate response to the grace revealed to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So again, obedience is not a condition for grace, but it's the only appropriate response to the grace already given to us in Jesus Christ through the cross, through his resurrection, through his spirit that he's given us freely. That's the gospel. It took me a while to get to the gospel, but that's the gospel. It's a short message today, but this is something that we're going to look at again and again. It's a recurring theme in the book of Galatians. We're going to come back to it again and again. This is just a taste. Let's pray. Father, um, we are uh, incapable of uh, grasping uh, the love of God, the grace of God, uh, the kindness and tenderness of God. It is all only through the power of your Holy Spirit working in our lives that we are able to 
sense the presence of God in, in our lives and sense how much you love us and how much you care for us. And I pray that you may open our eyes to see what Jesus Christ has done for us and find that wondrous and find that wonderful and find that amazing. Uh, help us to live in the reality of, of you in our lives every day. Help us not to be distracted or, or encumbered by um, the things of this world that cause us up to, to be blind to your grace towards us. You love us. So much you love us. So help us to sense your love. So do this work, I pray, for your glory's sake and for our joy's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.